Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, through the miracle of technology, we have the opportunity to, uh, to share from the Mill Creek campus this morning. My name is Sterling. If I haven't met you yet, I am the campus pastor at our Mill Creek campus. So it's, a, it's fun for me to be able to share from this stage and in this room this morning, kind of in my natural habitat with all of you. And it's good to continue in our series entitled, Did God Say That? Last week, if you were with us, Pastor Brian told the story. He was looking at the phrase, God has a perfect plan for your life. And he was talking about when he, he was dating Lorene and, and wondering about marriage and wondering what God's plan was for their relationship and wrestling with that. And I want to I kind of tee off that and take us a little bit further back in the dating process. Some of you will relate to this. To the point in time when you're just starting to spend time with somebody. Maybe you met in a group or you met online and you're talking and, and you're spending time. Maybe you're even just, just the two of you now and, and you're starting to wonder where is this going and, and what is this about? Back when, when uh, I was in college in Moody a long time ago, we used to have a term for the conversation about, about where a relationship was at. In fact, we had a, an acronym for it. Christian colleges have a weird culture around dating, but that, that's a whole other story. But we called it the RDT, which was a relationship-defining talk, or some people called it a DTR, define the relationship, right? Where, where we've been hanging out now, and we're spending time together, so where are you at and where am I at? Is this, are we just friends, or is this going to be something more, which it's usually the point in time in the conversation where the other person would say something like, yeah, I just, I just thought we were hanging out. I just thought we were friends. I was like, yeah, me, me too, you know. Um, maybe you can relate to that. I, I bring this up because the, the phrase, the saying that we're going to look at today, we are all God's children, I think is an effort and, and, and a, an honest one to provide some kind of clarity or understanding to how we as human beings relate to God. It's, it's an attempt on our part to sort of define the relationship. Right? This is, after all, one of the fundamental questions that philosophers and theologians have wrestled with and debated throughout the history of, of, of uh, scholarship, as well as just one of the questions that we wrestle with and debate in our own hearts and minds as individuals. What, what am I to you? Is, am I someone that you just put up with, or is there the possibility that this could be something more? I want to add real quickly how much I have um, enjoyed and appreciated this series that we've been a part of this summer. Uh, did God say that? Not only for the benefit of looking at each of these individual phrases and thinking about how we, what we mean when we communicate them or say them in our own experience with modern Christianity, but I think even more so just practicing and learning again the importance of thinking critically and, and pushing everything through the lens of God's authoritative word to see what we're talking about, what we mean. Does it align with, with what God teaches us? How do we understand life and faith and a relationship with him? I think this is an absolutely critical skill in, in the life of every follower of Jesus and, and something that we need to apply all the time. Even to when myself or Pastor Brian or Pastor Jeff or anyone is standing up here teaching, to be able to filter that through God's word to say, okay, does that, does that align with what God teaches us? With that said, I want to take some time today to look closely at this phrase, we are all God's children. And one of the things that's interesting about this phrase is that it, it, it sort of captures one of the story arcs that, that flows from the very first pages of Scripture all the way to the end in the book of, of Revelation. I want to track that a little bit this morning. And I want to begin by looking at and understanding that we are all God's creation. We are all God's creation. Just out of curiosity this week, I, I googled this phrase, we're all God's children, just to see where it gets used, how it gets used, who uses it, and in what context in our own culture. And of course, there is, it's all over the place. There's, you can find quotes from celebrities and athletes and, and just about everybody. But one of the occurrences that happens most frequently is in the context of, of politicians. Um, everywhere from current 
um, candidates to uh, retired senators and, and congressmen and congresswomen and uh, Supreme Court justices have all used this phrase. Here's just one example. This is from a retired uh, U.S. senator, and she said it this way. She said, we are all different, yet we are all God's creation. We are all united behind this country in the cause of freedom, justice, fairness, and equality. This is what unites us, she said. And I found a lot of quotes that echo something similar to that, 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 that communicate that same sentiment. That we're acknowledging that we as humanity share a common bond, that we're endowed with a level of worth and value as the result of, of God's creative work. And of course, we can say that, and that is absolutely true. And in fact, when we look at this question, we need to start at this point. We need to start in God's creative narrative. Some of you may be familiar with this passage, but this is in Genesis chapter 1. When as God is, there's this, this just beautiful poetic description of God's creative act. And it gets to the point when he is shaping and speaking life into humanity. And this is what it says. This is Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that he may, they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. Now, some of you may be very familiar with that passage, and, and others of you might be hearing this for the very first time. But either way, these verses in Genesis chapter 1 are describing the unique nature of God's creation. What makes us as human beings distinct from everything else that God created? What's more is that this is foundational in our entire understanding and theology of, of life and the value of life, of, of our humanness, of how we relate to each other, and ultimately how we relate to God. And so today I want to just take a few brief moments just to think together about some of the implications or the truth behind the fact that you and I bear the image of God that has been placed on us from the very point of creation. And the first implication that I want us to understand as we think about this is that every man, woman, and child has inherent dignity, value, and worth because they are an image bearer of God, every single one. In fact, let me take you for a moment, if I can, through a brief exercise here. I want you, just where you're at now, I want you to imagine, I want you to uh, think of someone in this world that you are most upset with. Somebody that you're angry at, or, or, or the person that you would least like to be around right now, right? If they're sitting in the room with you, don't like give them the side eye right now. Just picture them in your head. It can be a family member. It could be a neighbor. It could be a coworker. It could be a celebrity or a politician, whoever. It doesn't really matter. I, I want you to imagine them in your mind. And then I want you to say, again, you can just think this, but to that person, I want you to say to them, you bear the image of our creator God. You have inherent dignity and value and worth to him and to me. Again, imagining this person, you, have, you bear the image of the creator God and you have inherent dignity and value and worth to him and to me. See, this this reality is, is why something like racism or sexism, why these can have no place in the body of Christ. That, that it's completely out of line with, with what Scripture tells us about how God views us and how we are to view each other. For me to think about or to view anyone in, in, or any group of people as having less value or less dignity or less eternal worth than God himself has placed on them is sin. And when I recognize, whether this is an attitude or thought or action, when I recognize that in, in and of myself, it needs to bring me to a point of confession and ultimately of repentance. 
The Apostle John, he words it this way. He says, it's, it's essentially impossible to love God and hate our brother and sister. They're irreconcilable, he says. This is from 1 John chapter 4. John writes, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And God has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. In fact, John chapter 4 has, has a tremendous amount to say about the implications of the image of God in us and how that is experienced in our relationship with God and ultimately in our relationships together. He says, for us to view, to understand that God has placed this value, worth, and dignity in every human being and then not to love them means that we, somewhere we are misunderstanding something. And he says, it's impossible to love God and then hate my brother and sister. This, this, this is an implication, the, the outworking of the reality that every single human being, no matter where our level of agreement or disagreement is with them, has inherent value, worth, and dignity. And, and, and we're called to treat each other that way. The second implication that, that, that factors into this whole conversation that we need to talk about then is that we were created for a relationship with God. The image of God in us is what makes it possible for us to relate to God. In fact, if we had time today, we could go through Genesis 1 and 2 and what we would discover, and I encourage you to do this this week, reread those passages. What we would discover is this description of humanity living in uninhibited, perfect relationship with God and with each other. There's no shame, there's no guilt, there's no oppression or manipulation. It's it's perfect unity. And what we discover in this creation narrative is that this is what we were made for. In fact, I, I would tell you that this is so ingrained in your created nature that in the absence of this relationship, that it's it's impossible for us to feel fully satisfied. That that we're not fully human in the absence of experiencing something that we were designed for. Thirdly, then, what we discover here as we think about this is that sin separates. Sin separates. This is Genesis chapter 3 as the story, the narrative continues. This is after Adam and Eve have rebelled against God and there's just all these ramifications of this. This is the end of the, the third chapter of Genesis, verse 22. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And hear this, he says, so the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim in a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. There's, there's this, you can almost feel the, the pain of the separation here. What was once unified in, in, in perfect experience, perfect relationship is now marred by separation. And so the, the consequence of sin, whether it's original sin as we talk about here, or it's, it's my own sin prior to placing my faith in Jesus for salvation, is that it, it takes the very thing that I was designed for, what I was created to experience, what the image of God makes possible in me, and it separates us. It it severs the relationship. The very thing that you were created for no longer becomes uh, possible. And then this starts to multiply itself out over the course of, of all our relationships, and we experience this brokenness all around us all the time. Jesus, when, you know, Jesus would teach his disciples so frequently, he would talk in parables, and, and he would use a story in order to explain a point. And one of the most famous parables is the parable of the lost son in Luke chapter 15. And when Jesus is, is talking about this implication, he describes it as a son who comes to his father and says, look, I, don't, I no longer want a relationship with you. I no longer want to live in your house. I want to determine for myself how my life is going to go. So you know what? Just give me what's mine. 
and I'm going to take it and leave, and, and you're essentially dead to me. Like Jesus, this is Jesus' way of depicting the implication of sin. And yet, God does not leave us here. The story continues. And so out of this, we, we are all God's creation. We're separated by sin, but then God comes and he creates a family. God creates, he chooses a family. When I was back, when I was a youth pastor here at Chapel Street, I uh, would oftentimes take our students as our current youth leaders do to, um, to Ecuador and Mexico and Puerto Rico and all these different places. And one of the exercises in our training that I would do with our students was to, to help them write a team covenant. And by that, I would just bring a whiteboard into the, to the room and I would say, what are, what are going to be the principles, the guidelines that we live by over the course of this, this trip? And the students, we would just they would shout things out, like, we're going we're gonna to tell each other the truth even when we don't want to, and we'd write that down, and we're going to respect each other's stuff, whatever it was, whatever, whatever came to their mind. And then we would have time to kind of look at the whole whiteboard and say, is this capture what we, what we want this to be? Is this, are we all agreeing to this? So we would kind of combine things and take stuff out, and I would take it, and I'd, I'd write it up, and we'd pass it out to the team, and every single one of us uh, the adults and the students alike would sign it and say, okay, this is, we are agreeing to live under this. This is how we are going to relate to each other. See, as, as this story continues, and again, if you have a chance to continue reading in, in Genesis, you're going to discover that things do not improve. In fact, Genesis chapter 3 through Genesis chapter 11 is just a series of the, the implications of, of sin. There's murder and oppression. There's abuse. It's, it's celebrated. It's, it's, it is ugly stuff. It, it culminates or really spirals to the point of the Tower of Babel where God sends people out in every direction sp- uh, speaking different la- uh, languages. The situation is, is bad. But again, this is, this is a critical moment because this is where we see God intervene. This is now Genesis chapter 12. We're in the midst of this situation, in the midst of all this brokenness, God is going to choose out for himself a family. This is Genesis 12 verse 1. It says, The Lord God said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household, and I will show, uh, show you a land. And I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And hear this, and he says, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God, God here, we're beginning to capture, we're beginning to discover the beginning of a rescue plan. Right? Uh, uh, rather than abandoning us in the mess that has resulted Uh, from sin God is choosing he's calling out a family and not only does he separate this family out for the purpose of of rescuing humanity from the impact of sin he begins to establish with this family a covenant that the means whereby they're going to to do life together the means and understanding of how they'll relate together this is now Genesis 15 a few pages over In verse 4 now, he says this, he says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, meaning to Abraham. And God is speaking. He says, This man will not be your heir. So Abraham has just said, Lord, where is this promise that that you said? Because right now, everybody who is, the person who's going to get everything that I own, who's going to be my heir, is, is this guy that works for me. So the Lord is speaking into this question now. He says, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And he took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. Now God is establishing this this covenant with Abraham. And here's the point that I want us to see, that I want us to think about this morning. That when God 
When God moved to rescue humankind from what separated us from, his, from sin, he did so by calling out a, a, a family and establishing with them a covenant. And this is, this is the story of the entire Old Testament that he's working on providing this way back into relationship with him, back into his presence, that which they experienced in the garden, back what, to what you and I were created for. Now, if, if, if we take the time to track the story of this family throughout the whole Old Testament, we're going to discover that there are fabulous moments when there's great faithfulness and trust and it goes well, and we'll discover, you, discover that there are some really difficult, bad moments. But what's amazing is that God's plan continues to progress. And so despite all the ups and downs, despite all the failures on, on the human side of the story, God is faithful. That he is the keeper of his covenant. And this leads us to the third thing that, that is, I think really speaks into this, this statement, we're all God's children, and that's God's adoption plan. God's adoption plan. If, if you were with us over the summer, you might have seen on one of our Wednesday Night Lives, um, Allie and Jonathan Goble share some of their story. If you may know, Allie is one of our worship leaders here at the Mill Creek campus. Her and her husband, Jonathan, um, adopted a little boy a little over a year ago whose name is, is Jaden. He's just adorable, and, and they love him. And I, it got me thinking, listening to their story, it got me thinking about my own family's history and experience with, with adoption. And in my generation, several of my cousins are, are adopted, and I was just trying to understand that experience and wrap my head around this. And one of the things that stood out to me is that there is no distinction in, in the Moore family between those of us who were born into the family and those of us who were adopted into the family. In fact, you almost don't recognize, you, you almost forget the fact that, that some of them don't share the same biology. Because all of the benefit, all of the rights, all of the experiences, everything, all the belonging that comes with being a part of the Moore family is fully and 100% available to them. It's theirs. You are, they are a part of the family. And Allie and Jonathan, as they told this story of their son, Jaden, were, were describing how this is just a picture of what God does in our life is that is that his plan is to draw us in to make us a part of his family. This, this, through this set-apart family, a family who would become a nation, the nation of Israel, God would send his, his one and only son to ultimately fulfill that promise that we read um, that God made with Abraham. And of course, this is what we talk about as it, Chapel Street is the message of the gospel. That in believing in Jesus, by placing our faith and trust in him for the forgiveness of our sins, we're, we are adopted in doing that as God's sons and daughters that were placed into his family. The Apostle John says it this way in John chapter 1. He says, Yet to all who did receive, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of human descent nor a human, de nor a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God, right? He gave the right to become children of God. The Apostle Paul in, in Galatians chapter 3 says it this way. He says, so in Christ Jesus, that's, that's the operative phrase here, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And then he goes on to say, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And hear this, he says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. You are heirs according to the promise. Did you see what he's saying there? Paul's saying, when you place your faith in Christ, you are adopted into this family that God has set apart for relationship with him. This is, this is what the church is. This is what it means to be a child of God. So to be a child of God, isn't, it's not merely a birthright. It isn't some universal term. It's an act of grace. 
It's by grace that we're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves, but it's a gift of God. And it's God's ultimate plan. God's, God's intention, his purpose, is to adopt you as his son or daughter. And he would accomplish this by sending his one and only son into the world so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, every single one of us, without exception, are God's creation. We, we bear the image of God, the imago Dei. And as a result, we have eternal worth and value. And it's God's desire to rescue us from, from the separation that we experience as a result of sin back into all the rights and privileges that we receive as his sons and daughters. And we do that by placing our faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sin. And so if you're watching this this morning, wherever you are, if, if you have put your faith in Jesus... If you, if you have said, I, I trust Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins, I want you to hear me this morning and know that you are adopted, fully adopted into God's family as his son or daughter. In fact, Paul in Romans chapter 8 calls you a co-heir with Christ. Like that is a significant, and we need to live, the calls to live in that identity. If you're here this morning, if you're hearing these words and, and you're still wrestling with some of that, that longing that's born out of, of a desire for a relationship with God that was in you from the time you were created, I want you to hear this as an invitation. I, I, I want you to know that this is God's heart and his desire for you is to welcome you into his family as his son or daughter. And he makes that available to you through his son, Jesus Christ who came to become one of us, who lived a perfect, love, who took, a perfect life, who took on sin and shame and guilt and all the consequences he bore on the cross. And then he conquered death and hell by rising from the grave. And he says, if you trust me, if, if you p- place the burden of your sin, if you confess that and you trust that with me for your forgiveness, then I'll make you my son or my daughter. You will be a part of of this family. That's his invitation to you, and he does so. He does all of that because he loves you. And you can make that decision today, right, right where you're at. You can say a simple prayer that just says, Lord, I'm, I trust you with my salvation. I trust you to forgive me of my sins, and I'm placing my faith in you. And you can be, you can initiate that relationship um, through what Christ offers to you because he loves you. Would you pray with me? Father, I just want to thank you again that in your perfect love for us, that you would send Jesus, your one and only son, into the world and that he would bear the price of of not only my sin, but all of our sins so that we could be restored back into relationship with you. Lord, thank you that you have made a way for us to live as your adopted sons and daughters, as co-heirs with Christ. I pray for everyone right now who's wrestling with that. Lord, I just pray that you would give them the faith to make this decision, to place their trust in you. And I pray that we as your church would live this out to the world around us, that we would take on this identity as your sons and daughters. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen.